This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Brothers, sisters, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege and a pleasure to address you on such a significant anniversary and also to be invited to speak about the early history of the Frog College. Evidence concerning that early history lies scattered in archives and collections in a wide range of places including Liège, Brussels, Paris, Rome, Vienna, Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., Stonyhurst College in Lancashire, and here in London, in the archives of the British province of the Society of Jesus. I've been very fortunate in the past decade or so to consult all those sources uh, for research I've done on the English Jesuit secondary uh, uh, level education, but much work still remains to be done on the higher level of education. Better to understand the international importance of this college what, uh, and in the early modern period uh, up to the French Revolution. In the time uh, of my disposal this morning, I'd like to explore the college's history via three broad themes, location, outreach, both missionary and intellectual, and ethos. And within that framework, I'd like to provide an outline sketch of the most significant aspects of the college's history, highlighting some of the most influential Jesuit priests and brothers and their work, include with brief consideration of some of the longer-term research that needs to be done better to understand the significance of the college in the early modern period. The Jesuit mission to England and Wales began in 1580, exactly 40 years after the foundation of the Society of Jesus in 1540, was necessarily a limited enterprise, at least initially owing to the hostile climate in which missioners here had to operate. Before 1614, the educational infrastructure normally present in a fully-fledged province of the Society of Jesus was not yet in place. English and Welshmen wishing to join the society had to pursue their higher studies in other Jesuit provinces. For example, Father Robert Jones, who was superior of the English Jesuit mission in 1614, at the time of the founding of this college, had to undertake all his studies in Rome. He studied first at the English college, Uh, he studied at the English College and then at the large building in the centre here, the uh, Collegio Romano, today the Gregorian University, where he went on to become a teaching member of the Faculty of Philosophy. Other early English Jesuits before 1614 studied either in Rome or in other provinces, particularly in Germany, at major Jesuit educational institutions such as the great colleges at Ingolstadt or Munich. So what motivated Father Robert Jones in 1614 to advise the then Superior General of the Society, Father Claudio Aquaviva, to set up a new English Jesuit House of Studies in Louvain, rather than anywhere else? Both men were striving for the very best, and this was a time of great confidence and growth in the Society of Jesus. If you look at the statistics here, just the top line, you can see the immense growth over a period of just over 30 years between 1579 and 1616, immediately before and after Fall Aquaviva's general. For English Jesuit purposes in 1614, Louvain was simply the best place to begin a new enterprise for the study of philosophy and theology. After all, Two of the most prominent uh, members of the Society of Jesus, Robert Bellamy, then still alive, and Peter Canisius, then recently deceased, had studied, preached, and lived there. The University of Louvain was graced by the distinguished Je uh, uh, Jesuit moral theologian, Leonardo Lessius, who taught and worked there. And decades earlier, St. Peter Faber had uh, undertaken important and successful missionary work in the city. And Louvain was also an attractive place. 
as the German cartographer and secular priest Georg Braun, oh. author of this map that was published in 1581, wrote, Louvain is the capital of Brabant, an important city of trade, but also the seat of learned men and the liberal arts. It is a large and liberal city. Inside the walls, it has open meadows, vineyards, large gardens, arable fields, orchards, bushes, forests, and pastures, and very sizable woods for walking in. There is virtually nowhere better suited to accommodate the muses and scholarship than this city. Louvain had prospered in the Middle Ages as a center of, the, of cloth manufacturing, and following the foundation of the university in 1425, become an important center of humanism during the Renaissance. <laughs> From an English Jesuit perspective, Louvain, besides providing the ideal new intellectual place for the future, also had a threefold geographical importance. And the handout you hopefully have in front of you will show you the, uh, the, those three dimensions. It's in the very heart of the Catholic uh, the Spanish Netherlands. The first map will show you how Louvain was placed really in the center of a growing diaspora of English and Welsh Catholic schools, colleges, and convents, then springing up in post Reformation Catholic Europe because of penal legislation at home. And the second map uh, in the middle of your handout shows you the huge importance from the Jesuit uh, dimension. The new enterprise at Louvain was located in the very center of the most extensive Jesuit enterprise in Western Europe, representing, represented by, on the north side, the Flandreau Belgic uh, province, and, the, and to the south, the Gallo Belgic province of the Society of Jesus. So the, the northern part is Flemish speaking, uh, the map here, uh, the southern part uh, uh, French speaking. By 1614, the Flemish Jesuits already had a very well-established house in Louvain, and by 1621, there were 43 Jesuit foundations in the two joining provinces, manned by some 1,300 Jesuits. This was an enormous enterprise. Louvain was, therefore, for a host of reasons, the ideal location for the leaders of the English Jesuit mission, striving in 1614 to open what in time would develop into the philosopher and theologian, the future fully-fledged English province of the Society of Jesus. And the map of the province, the, the English and Welsh side is on the back, back page of your handout. The province came into being in 1623. I should just explain from this map here that uh, mark in red, just very, very quickly, we have the secondary level school at saint Omer on the left here, founded in 1593. Uh, we've got um, uh, the Mont de there, the Flemish Bank, the centre there. The, the novitiate, a little bit complicated, the novitiate of the English mission began there in 1607 then transferred later to Liège, and then moved eventually in 1622-23 to Watton, near saint domain so a little bit of uh, running around uh, before things settled down. So there was the ideal. Uh, Louvain as an ideal place, but ideal and reality were two different matters. William Trumbull, the English representative of James I at the Brussels court of Habsburg Archduke, Albert, his consul Isabella, was no friend of English Catholics in general, nor of English Jesuits in particular. He deployed all the diplomatic and political pressure he could muster to dissuade the English Jesuits from settling and staying at Louvain. Additionally, as the university authorities there soon proved themselves opposed to the idea of the Flemish Jesuits setting up their own school of philosophy and theology, which might also be open to lay students, and that's an important part of the Jesuit mission at the time to involve the laity. Conditions for a comparable English Jesuit venture at Louvain in the long term looked unfavorable. So faced with these adversities, the English Jesuits began in the early 1620s 
to seek an alternative location for the development of what would become ultimately the Collegium Maximum, or the most significant college of their new province. And that new location was to be the independent principality of Liège. So to the city of Liège, the Louvain community of English Jesuit scholars and students moved in 1624, securing some semblance of a firm financial foundation for the new English college there by 1626. Now, to understand the politico-religious environment in which the new college was to operate down to 1794, one needs to appreciate uh, in outline, the complexity, strengths, and fragilities of the Principality of Liège. This was a curious, very curious, medieval, feudal, uh, political, and geographical entity. Part of the Holy Roman Empire, yet independent of it, and also independent of the neighboring Spanish Netherlands. Governance of the Principality lay uh, in a cathedral chapter of 40 land-owning canons. You have to own land to be a canon of the cathedral. Chanois très foncier, as they were called in French. They were supported by the nobility uh, and the tiers d'état, the third state, was representatives from 23 towns of the principality. Powerful support for the whole enterprise, the whole political structure uh, in the principality lay with the Wittelsbach family, Dukes Bavaria who were pro-Jesuit leaders of the German counter-reformation. They ensured the stability of the principality of Liège. Six members of the Wittelsbach family were prince bishops of Liège down to the 18th, middle of the 18th century. And it was Ferdinand of Bavaria who uh, allowed the English Jesuits to settle in the first place at Liège. Unbeknown to anyone in 1624, this fragile, feudal principality had but 170 years of existence left. Some 800 years of largely undisturbed history were to be shattered by the Révolution Liégeoise of 1789, swiftly to be followed in 1794 by the overrunning of the entire principality by the invading French Revolutionary Army. However, Within that space of 170 years, the English College, which is here, on the hillside there, during that period, despite several periods of financial hardship, the College was to prosper intellectually and spiritually. The move from Louvain to Liège in 1624 built on existing strong foundations. In 1614, the Jesuit superior general in Rome, Claudio Pacquiviva, had determined that the existing uh, novitiate at Louvain, founded in 1607, as I've already mentioned, should be relocated to the new site at to a new site at the edge. Funds for this were provided by the English governor of Mechelen, Maline, Sir William Stanley, the senior military officer and a religious exile from the service of the Habsburg Netherlands, whose brother was an English Jesuit. And the second benefactor was the third man in black at the right, William Brown. Grandson Sir Anthony Brown, first Viscount Montague of Cowdery Park, Sussex, and very grateful to John Culver, perhaps his keeper at Burley House in Stanford in Lincolnshire, who's allowed us to have this high definition uh, uh, reproduction of the very important portrait of the three brothers Brown. William Brown had become an English Jesuit brother at Louvain in 1612, and having abandoned the world, the trappings of a rich, courtly life at home, spent his remaining years in the humblest of occupations at the new college at the edge, including acting as a gardener in the laying out of the graceful new sloping terraces which adorned its hillside site. We know at this stage that Jesuit gardens, particularly in the Bissiots, the Society of Jesus, were important places of, and had important spiritual functions as reminders uh, uh, and hopefully as a foretaste of things heavenly. In the absence of clear evidence, we can only speculate as to whether or not the garden of the English College of Liège had such a spiritual, spiritual pedagogical purpose. William Brown also seems to have been a gifted composer, and musicologists believe him to be identical with the 
with the Guillermo Bruno Inglese, who was known to be composing keyboard music in the Low Countries around 1620. Some of William Brown's music may be heard this evening at the concert. The English Jesuit division at Liège had moved about 1624, as I've already said, to Watton, near saint omer as originally planned following the death of the Archduke Albert, who deposed its foundation there in 1607. So this opened the way for the existing philosophers and theologians at Louvain to move and occupy the new premises at the edge, becoming thus the Collegium Maximum, the new English Jesuit province. The buildings, the grounds of the edge were described in 1629 by the Welsh religious controversialist and spy Lewis Owen as forming a very sumptuous college, many elements of which have survived down to the present day. The buildings today, and I'll show an image of those a little later, form part of the headquarters of the Belgian regional government of Wallonia. In 1626, Maximilian I, the Jesuit-educated Wittelsbach elector of Bavaria, presented the new English foundation to the edge with a large benefaction of 240,000 Rhine florins and promised the college an annual pension thereafter. Despite late and sometimes reduced payments owing to wars and economic problems, the Bavarian pension continued to be paid to the college down to the middle of the 18th century. Given its strong connections with the House of Bavaria in the 17th and 18th centuries, the English College of Liège, also known as the Collegium Anglo-Bavaricum, uh, became almost certainly the largest ecclesiastical <coughs> institution uh, in the Principality of Liège, with 44 Jesuits in 1625, rising to 94 in 1638, and settling to an average of 60 to 70 thereafter. At various times, the college also had a complement of French-speaking lay students who were citizens of the Principality, but who were unable to travel a long distance to Louvain for their higher education. Though it's important to note that at Louvain, the university authorities often complained of what, what, uh, about what they saw as uh, an English Jesuit encroachment, what they considered to be their educational monopoly in the region. Down to the suppression of the Society of Jesus in 1773, the Jesuit priests, brothers and students of the college interacted both with the English-speaking Catholic exiles who came to settle in the Principality and with the citizens of Liège. The latter flocked to the college for uh, uh, masses and other services. Additionally, the secular clergy of the Diocese of Liège made regular retreats there. And the students and the Staff of the college provided relief for the poor of the city, not least during civic disturbances in the mid 1630s, as well as bringing <coughs> spiritual comfort during the plague, the plague which took away and took the life of Brother William Brown in 1637. When, more than a century later, in 1773, Pope Clement XIV ordered the universal suppression of the Society of Jesus. At the edge, a special, specially created commission of nine canons drawn from the uh, Privy Council uh, of the Principality took charge of arrangements and suppressed all the Jesuit houses in the Principality. Um, major school run by the Walloon Jesuits, Scots College at Dinan, and of course the English College, which in fact was the only institution to survive. Such was the great esteem in which the college was held by the authorities that the then Prince Bishop, Charles, uh, Francois Charles de Bellebrook, allowed the now suppressed English Jesuits of the age to retain their corporate identity, provided that they abandoned all their external Jesuit customs and adopted the dress and the uh, uh, status of secular clergy of the Diocese of Liège. And here in this image, we have the, uh, the, the last Jesuit rector of the English College, the Lancashireman, John Howard, dressed not as a Jesuit, he's now an ex-Jesuit, dressed in the secular dress, the, 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 the dress of the secular clergy of the Diocese of uh, Liège, which is the standard dress 
adopted by those ex-Jesuits who remained with it. What was now converted into the Académie Anglaise, a new institution, a hybrid institution, which brought together, because of the suppression, in the Austrian Netherlands next door, students, briefly students who'd been at saint omer had had to flee uh, 11 years earlier to Bruges, and then at the suppression, the Bruges community moved to the edge, and everything coalesced into one hybrid institution uh, called the Académie Anglaise. This unusual educational situation obtained down to 1794, when the staff, uh, the, the, the staff and the junior and senior students at the edge were forced to flee uh, as the invading French army descended on the principality. At this crucial juncture, a significant friend and former student of the suppressed English Jesuits, Thomas Weld of Lulworth and Dorset, stepped in, offering the use of his largely unused northern seat, Stonyhurst Hall in Lancashire, as a new home for the academic refugees. Now, the detailed, heroic story of this, this story that lasts from the end of July 1794 to the end of August, this hurried flight of the community from uh, uh, Liège in that <coughs> summer, their forced sale of part of their uh, possessions as they tried to refloat their overladen barges, which had become stuck in the mud of the River Meuse at Liège, their uncomfortable eight day journey on the very last boat from Maastricht to Rotterdam before the arrival of the French army their long voyage across the North Sea to Harwich and then to Hull, and then by barge from Selby to Skipton, and finally a weary trek by road from Skipton to Stonyhurst has been recounted elsewhere. Despite all the privations and the losses of many, many things, the staff and the scholars arrived, and thanks to the swift intervention of Thomas Weld, the studies began again at Stonyhurst on the 21st of October, 1794, just three months and one week after the final classes of the edge. That unbroken continuity of the educational work of the college from 1614 down to the present day has constituted one of the most extraordinary phenomena in British educational history. The role of Thomas Weld in assuring that continuity is significant. It's much more than his giving or his presenting a possibility of a new place at Stonyhurst. Well, was a graduate of the prestigious pre-suppression Jesuit University at pont a mousson in Lorraine, which by 1794 had long disappeared. He, had, he, well, had personally witnessed all the key events of the 18th century in continental Europe, leading to the destruction of the Society of Jesus. In 1794, the French Revolution now threatened to destroy the unique educational work of the suppressed English Jesuits at the edge. By allowing them, by allowing the exiles from the edge to settle at Stonyhurst, Thomas Weld was providing a springboard for the long hoped for res res uh, re restoration of the English province and for an eventual renaissance of English Jesuit education at both the secondary and the tertiary levels. Taken as a whole, the transplanted English Academy of Liège, which became Stonyhurst College in 1794, with its school for lay pupils and its course of higher studies in philosophy and theology for older students, was no less than an embryonic English equivalent of the college and the university at pont a mousson which well had, where well had been so happy as a youth, but which by then, as I've said, had long been destroyed. <coughs> By allowing the use of Stonyhurst and ultimately handing over the property to the new province, the restored province, <coughs> as a free gift to the body, as it was called in the, in the, uh, in the uh, handover document, Weld effectively made himself the re-founder on English soil of the earlier foundations at Louvain and Liège. In the limited time this morning, I'd like to illustrate the extensive missionary and scholarly outreach of the Louvain, the Louvain and uh, Liège Foundations by focusing briefly on the work of five key Jesuits involved in either or both occasions. 
and the ways in which they advanced the reputation of the college internationally. The first was Father Andrew White, uh, born in London, educated at St. Omer's, and then became, became a secular priest in England before being expelled from the kingdom in 1606 after the gunpowder plot, in which he played no part. Ten years after entering the Society of Jesus at the recently opened English Novitiate in Louvain, 1607, he was appointed Professor of Theology at the new Jesuit House in Louvain in 1617, and he moved with the Theologate to Liège in 1624. In the summer of 1629, he was posted to England, but not before he had volunteered for the North American missions. <coughs> His request was honoured, and in 1633, he was appointed superior of the three Jesuits sent to found the new Maryland mission, a bold venture undertaken by the fledgling uh, English Jesuit province. In three extant uh, accounts, White describes the journey and, and the colony both for his religious superior and for future colonists. <coughs> he studied the native uh, languages of the American Indians, and uh, unfortunately, his, his dictionary, grammar, and catechism in the Timucuana language no long, are no longer extant. But a few pages of prayers and commandments translated into Konoi, the, uh, the language of the Iskataway Indians, survive at Georgetown. Andrew White, while Andrew White remained superior of the Maryland mission until 1638, and was sent back uh, to England uh, in chains on a charge of high treason uh, because he was uh, said to be in violation of the Elizabethan statute. And he pleaded because he'd been forcibly carried into the realm and held against his will. Andrew White's younger contemporary, Thomas Compton Carlton, like White himself, was educated at St. Omer's, and uh, by 1628 had been appointed <coughs> Professor of Philosophy and Theology and Prefect of Studies at the Edge, where he remained for most of the rest of his life. Immensely gifted as a teacher, he published important handbooks on philosophy and theology. His uh, uh, Philosophia Universa, uh, published in Antwerp in 1649 and printed thereafter several times as the Cursus Philosophicus Inversus, we have a copy here. It's a well-organized treatment of the main branches of philosophy. While his Prome Prometheus Christianus, published at Antwerp in 1652, surveys the field of moral philosophy on the basis of 19 disputationes, and also contains an important address to Compton students at the edge. His later monumental two volume Cursus Theologici, Thomas Primus and Thomas Posterior, published at the edge between 1659 and 1664, comprises more than a thousand pages. It was dedicated to Ferdinand Maria, a lecturer of Bavaria, saluting the college's continuing indebtedness to the financial patronage provided by the Wittelsbach family. The many subsequent editions of Father Compton Carlton's works and two posthumous publications dealing with Aristotelian philosophy testify to his reputation. He died at the edge in 1666 in the college. Now, the European-wide high reputation of Father Carlton was paralleled by his younger contemporary, uh, Father uh, Francis Lyon, alias Hall, who was appointed Professor of Mathematics and Hebrew at the College of Liège in 1632. In case the mention of mathematics should sound surprising in the context of a college devoted to the study of philosophy and theology, it's worth remembering that for St. Ignatius Loyola, the liberal arts comprised logic, physics, metaphysics, moral philosophy, and some mathematics. And this wide curricular thinking is embedded within the International Jesuit Plan of Studies, Ratio Studiorum, published first in 1599, which guided the shaping of the curriculum in Jesuit schools and colleges at whatever level. The study of uh, philosophy at the age embraced natural philosophy, science, and professors in these fields were engaged in research and teaching in astronomy, geography, horology, natural history, mathematics, and music. Music was then 
viewed in all tertiary colleges as a branch of mathematics. As we hear this evening, probably we have the first performance, I think, in Britain of music by the great German Jesuit mathematician and astronomer Christopher Claudius. At Liège, Francis Lyne built up a formidable reputation of, of the, as the designer of various types of sundial, which demonstrated his ingenuity and mathematical competence. When the future Charles II visited the age in the 1650s, he was so impressed by one of Father Lyne's sundials, a great pyramid-shaped structure bearing seven dials located in the college gardens, that 20 years later, he commissioned the construction of a similar one here in London in the Privy Garden at Whitehall. During that 20-year interlude, Francis Lyne at the age became embroiled in a range of scientific arguments, notably with Robert Boyle, on the subject of what we, we today would term atmospheric pressure. Though Lyne ultimately lost the debate, the intellectual exchange between the two men forced Boyle to clarify his arguments and expound the principle now known as Boyle's Law. Back to the, the sundial, having been invited by Charles II to construct his Whitehall sundial, Lyne wrote his explication of the dial set up in the King's Garden at London but returned to Liège before its publication there in Latin and English versions with an engraving, several engravings in fact, in 1673. The structure was unfortunately lost late one evening in 1674 when the rakish John Wilmot, second Earl of Rochester, and his friends passed through the Privy Garden in a state of inebriated exuberance <coughs> and smashed its glass spheres into pieces. <laughs> Edmund Slaughter, a Jesuit from Herefordshire, followed in Lyne's footsteps at the edge, teaching Hebrew, mathematics, and theology, and publishing in 1699 his most successful work, a Hebrew grammar. Published in Amsterdam, uh, then a key center for the publication of Hebrew texts, and Slaughter's book proved to be a useful, practical guide to the basic principles of Hebrew. Its success and popularity is attested in the many, many reprints of the work which continued to appear well down into the second half of the 19th century. In 1702, he also published an important handbook on arithmetic, which was republished in several places across Europe. We have a Cologne version here. And Slaughter was rector of the college at the edge from 1701 to 1704, and witnessed the siege and occupation of the city in 1702 by the forces of John Churchill, later the Duke of Marlborough whom he apparently met on that occasion. The scientific distinction of the College of the Edge reached its apogee in the 18th century through the remarkable work of um, Father Thomas Hilliard, who taught philosophy, theology, and mathematics. Hilliard was an extremely talented engineer. In 1720, he was probably the first person in continental Europe successfully to build a steam engine after the designs of Thomas Newcomen. These have been smuggled to the edge by a, by a consortium of Irishmen involved in industrial espionage. <laughs> Hilliard had no part of the espionage <laughs> aspect of things, but he was the key person in continental Europe who actually built what these men had plans for. He was also noted for devising a number of innovative clocks, the most magnificent of which is the chronometrum. Mirabile Leodiense, the wonder clock of Liège. This was an ingenious, four, was, is, still is, an ingenious four-faced table clock, giving the time of day, information from the calendar, and all kinds of astronomical details. Today, it forms part of the Spanish court collections and stands in the private study of King Juan Carlos in the Vazuela Palace in Madrid. I wrote in January this year to the private secretary of the king explaining that we had an important date today and would they kindly release some high definition digital photos. We're well, the first audience anywhere I think to see these in high definition as the other two faces of the clock. Uh, these, uh, I say, the clock stands in the, in the private study. The king is one of his, if not his favorite timepiece. Fortunately, I secured the photos just before the applicator. <laughs> <laughs> Taken together, the work 
of the five English Jesuits whom I've singled out for attention this morning, Andrew White, Thomas Carlton, Francis Lyon, David Slaughter, and Thomas Hilliard, there are many others whose achievements one has cited time allowed, demonstrate an, ex an astonishingly broad range of excellence and achievement in the missionary, philosophical, theological, linguistic, and scientific fields. None of this could have been achieved without the highest educational standards, rigorous training, and access to excellent library facilities, which we know existed at the edge. There is no time to explore that aspect of life at the edge in this paper, but we shall hear uh, more about the importance and significance of Jesuit library culture in Professor Campbell's paper shortly. Of themselves, however, excellent education, libraries, teaching, and research would have counted for little over the 180-year time frame of the colleges at Louvain and the Edge, had the whole educational enterprise not been infused with a clear Jesuit ethos. And that is something I'd like to touch on briefly in the final section of this paper. In the first part of the paper, I referred to the political fragility of the essentially feudal principality of the Edge. As the last director of the English College of the Age and the first president of the new academy there, John Howard was acutely aware not only of that fragility, but also of the fragility in his own community of suppressed English Jesuit colleagues. On the one hand, the continuation of the entire enterprise of the academy after 1773 depended on the goodwill and the potentially fickle conseil privé directed by the Prince Bishop. And theoretically, at least, their condition for the academy to continue to exist might have been rescinded at any moment. On the other hand, after 1773, as the continuation of the former Collegium Maximum of the suppressed, the now suppressed English Jesuit province, the community at the edge was the only one remaining with any semblance of the Jesuit ethos. All the, Jesuit, all the now suppressed Jesuits in England and Wales had become members of the secular clergy by force. Though publicly, the community at the edge was not allowed to, to demonstrate the Jesuit identity, privately, the spirituality of the college remained unaltered. For example, internally within the academy, all the major feasts of the Jesuit calendar continued to be observed rigorously. More significantly, suppressed Jesuits in England and Wales looked to the academy both as the custodian of all that was the best pre-suppression English Jesuit tradition and the potential future means by which a, a, a much hoped for restoration of the province would ultimately come about. None of this was lost on John Howard. First, with the help of the Prince Bishop, John Howard in 1778 secured a papal brief entitled Catholici Praesules. Granted by Pope Pius VI, this gave the academy the status of an enduring pontifical academy with the right provide high-level courses in philosophy and theology, thus preserving formally the educational provision of the pre-suppression foundations at the back and the edge. Secondly, Howard attempted early in 1783 to aggregate the Liège community to the small remnant of Jesuits surviving in White Russia, where the Empress Catherine the Great had refused to promulgate the papal rule of suppression. Though Howard did not meet with success in his request for aggregation for reasons beyond his control, his very attempt was carefully noted in Russia and respected. And the remembrance of this, 20 years later in 1803, long after his death, paved the way towards the restoration of the English province that year. In October 1783, just months before, uh, just months after his approach to the Jesuit Superior General in Russia, John Howard, as he lay dying in the edge, addressed his suppressed Jesuit brethren for the last time, urging them to maintain their Ignatian spirituality and corporate identity, and to remain faithful to Ignatian ideals, if they would continue to continue to function. As he said to his community, submission and entire obedience and dependence with perfect disengagement of ourselves in seeking only God's grace and glory in our sanctification, in every good we can do to our neighbor. This is the true spirit of St. Ignatius and of our holy constitutions, which if we choose, we may still observe with a very great perfection. John Howard had steered the college at Liège and the academy through an immensely difficult period of suppression and had dealt with major outbreaks 
breakers of smallpox in the late 1770s, which had killed the members of the community. And he also resisted immense pressure from the aristocracy, the Catholic aristocracy in England, to abandon his uh, Jesuit ideals. As he said on his deathbed, to pretend to establish new rules or to guide ourselves in another new system would be absurd. If we behave ourselves in the manner and the spirit mentioned before, it would be a great source of contempt and confidence of death. While the Howard's dying words were respected and followed by his confreres, his advice was heeded, and the precautionary measures that he took before his death to protect the interests of the academy proved efficacious in the long term. Had he not acted in the way he did, we would almost certainly not be celebrating this 400th anniversary today. In conclusion, I mentioned earlier that the buildings of the age had, that had to be abandoned in the summer of 1794, uh, which were ultimately confiscated, today form the headquarters of the regional government of Wallonia. When they were fully restored uh, about 15 years ago, um, the authorities uh, deemed it apt to commemorate the distinguished scientific tradition of the college by commissioning a large contemporary sundial as a major feature of the architectural project. In many ways, the Liège chapter of the history of the college uh, arguably it's, it is still unfinished business. And three significant research challenges remain. First of all, in the rush to evacuate the academy in 1794, a lead casket containing the mortal remains of the Jesuit martyr, Blessed Peter Wright, a former member of the English College, who was executed here in London at Tyburn in 1651, was hurriedly buried, ready for subsequent retrieval. In all the confusion of the flight to Stonyhurst, the precise whereabouts of the buried casket were lost. An attempts at retrieval, first in 18, 1818, and more recently in 1956, proved unsuccessful. Given the, success, given the current sophistication of geophysical survey techniques, with goodwill from the relevant authorities, might it yet be possible to locate that casket and repatriate it, affording those mortal remains the best of the right the respect they deserve? Secondly, the university libraries, both at Liège and Georgetown, preserve two important sets of manuscripts which detail the philosophical, theological, and scientific curriculum taught at the edge. They have not yet been analyzed in any depth and promised to throw important new light on the early history of the college. Finally, the most important and precious tomes of the Academy Library of the Edge were packed for shipment to Stonyhurst in the summer of 1794. Many of them survived the journey to Lancashire, but 13 crates full of books seized by the French army at Maastricht that summer before they could be shipped to Stonyhurst. They were clearly deemed significant items and they were subsequently, subsequently transported to Paris at very considerable expense and trouble uh, at the cost of the French authorities. Thanks to increasingly sophisticated electronic library catalogues containing provenance records, which are now freely available by the internet, it's become evident in very recent years that probably all of those books still survive today. They are slowly re-emerging in two libraries, the Bibliothèque Mazarin and the Bibliothèque saint jean How interesting it would be if a properly funded Anglo-French research project would reveal, analyze, and evaluate this hitherto hidden and long forgotten part of the college's cultural and intellectual